is hair. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my shop. It's Wednesday. It's Renaissance Woodwork and Live Time. Uh, as we're waiting for folks to show up when those little fancy live notifications pop out, um, let me know in the chat room if uh, audio sounds good as usual. I've always got weird audio bugs in my uh, ghosts in my machine over here, so you never can tell. Um, and yeah, let's just let's just throw the advertisements there. I've got a bunch of new uh, patrons this week over Patreon, so thank you to everybody who uh, decided to sponsor the show. I guess uh, I take a week off and uh, suddenly people sponsor the show. I don't know. Does that mean you missed me? Or maybe you just, people just realize that I'm doing this now. But yeah, if you did want to support my efforts here, I do appreciate it. Patreon.com slash Renaissance Woodworker. I, I, I love you all for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Bob, yes. Uh, my mom is actually doing better. I had to take last week off because um, my mom's been sick and she got uh, really bad really bad in like a matter of hours and uh there was concern that they were going to do a procedure and that she was not going to come out of it so it was a uh, you know during covid times you can't actually get in to see anybody so it was like do i hop a flight to colorado if i do that will i even be able to see her long story short the uh, procedure for her kidneys worked and she has turned around she's still not like great but definitely her kidneys are actually healthier than they were about two years ago now so we are all breathing a sigh of relief. We're happy that uh, we got through that, but um, I don't know. It was a rude awakening. Um, you know, all of her end of life stuff is in place, but there were a lot of legal clauses in there that required some interpreting. And it just, it wasn't, it wasn't fun for my brothers and myself to even have these conversations. It's way too early. My mom's not old enough to be having these conversations, but we've had them. So at least we can say that, you know, in 10, Hopefully 10, 15, 20 years, we, we know what's supposed to happen. But yeah, it was a, uh, it necessitated me taking a week away from this, but I hope you guys enjoyed the video that I put out. Yes, I actually put out a recorded video um, pitting that uh, $20 dovetail saw against a much more expensive dovetail saw. So hope you enjoyed that. So yeah, this week I actually got a really good question. It's something I've been kind of throwing around in my head for a while anyway. My sound is really pegging on my mixer. I'm going to turn that back a little. If that's too soft, anyone let me know, but I don't like when it, the mixer's flashing red at me right now. Um, a lot of folks, when they, they get into hand tools, they get real excited. Usually what happens to a lot of us is we buy a bunch of tools and we don't actually use them. And then suddenly it's time to build that first project. And you're like, great, I've got all these tools. And you go to work and you go, man, I suck at this. Like, wow, I can't plane a board, I can't saw a board to save my life. And it gets really frustrating really quickly. You know, there's no doubt there is a learning curve and we can watch a lot of people do a lot of things. I've been told that a lot of times when I'm planing, I make it look easy, which I suppose that's, that's a great compliment. And I, I remember being there, being really frustrated and thinking, well, how am I supposed to get any better? You know. Uh, I, I bought this, this wood, I don't want to waste it just by like making saw cuts on it. Um, and it, it becomes kind of a conundrum. So I wanted to talk about whether you want to call them practice exercises or warm up exercises, it's up to you. The key point there, the reason I say warm up exercises is it's not really something that you really ever stop doing. You know, you can get really good sawing, but I don't think it's like riding a bike. At least I haven't found that number of hours yet where it's like riding a bike. And I've been doing it for a long time and I do feel like I'm a pretty good sawyer, but there's still time to kind of warm up and get the body moving just like you would warm up to go for a run or go for a bike ride. You need to have that time to kind of get your eye-hand coordination going, get your focus, what I find more than anything, push away everything else and really focus on things. So as you're getting started, you can look at these things I'm gonna show you as some practice exercises that can help you get a better feel for a plane, a better feel for a saw. And later on down the road, say you're about to dive into a bunch of dovetails for a chest of drawers. You can run through one of these warm-up exercises just to kind of get things familiar again so that that first dovetail you cut is gonna look a lot better than warming up as you're cutting that dovetail. So um, <clears throat> the principle that I've discovered over the years is that 
you can build a project and there's no doubt improving your skills hand or power or whatever will go better in context if you have a project you're building you're going to learn a lot more because there's infinite variables in your typical woodworking project and you can practice you know dovetails all day long but will that translate to cutting tenons will that translate to cutting dados will that translate to glue ups to assembly to marking your projects to all the stupid mistakes that we make over the course of our project it, you can't really learn those really until you've made those those mistakes figured out how to recover from from them and then not make those mistakes again because you know what a pain in the butt it was to recover from it so yes that's the best way to learn but if anybody who's ever, let's just take a, pick a project, a typical table. You've built the table, four legs, four aprons, and a top. It's going to have eight mortise and tenon joints in there, two at each corner, right? Ideally. So you'll get started, and by the time you get to like that third tenon or that fourth tenon, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. Like you're warmed up and you're cutting on your lines and everything's going well. And you get to that sixth tenon, it's going even better. And that eighth tenon, you're just like I am the tenoning God, I can do nothing wrong. Then you move on to mortises. And then maybe you move on to planing the top. You move on to all the other stuff that happens in the building of that table. And if you're like a lot of hobbyist woodworkers, maybe you're only getting five hours, maybe 10 hours a week to work on that project. So that table could stretch out over the course of several weeks, even several months. So. If you cut those tenons way back at the beginning of that project, and then you finish out that project, it could be several months, three months, six months maybe, before you even cut a tenon again. So while you felt great, like unstoppable, like cut sawing tenons, when you finish that eighth tenon, when you come back to sawing tenons in three weeks, three months, a year maybe, it's like you've forgotten everything. It's not like riding a bike and suddenly you suck at tenons again. And you're just like, what the heck? Like I did all these tenons, I'm really good. And now I don't remember how to do them at all. And it's, you know, if you've cut 10,000 tenons, I suppose that learning curve is a heck of a lot shorter. But even then, there is that element of time, that warm up period before you can start cutting tenons again well. And herein lies the problem with just improving your skills by building projects because you don't actually make that many tenon cuts over the course of a typical project. You make even fewer dovetail cuts. Unless you're building a nine drawer chest of drawers, you might cut a lot of dovetails there, but you'll also find yourself doing even as much planing and fitting of drawers and all this other stuff that is not cutting dovetails. And the next time you go to cut one, you're gonna to be totally out of practice. I can remember in Woodworking in America 2014 maybe, somewhere in there. Um, they always had that hand tool Olympics thing and you could cut, uh, cutting dovetails was one of the events in there. And I showed up to cut the dovetails and I'm sitting here thinking, when was the last time I cut a dovetail? And like the last four projects I built were all table shaped. They were pretty much all mortise and tenon joinery. And it occurred to me, I had not cut a dovetail in more than 18 months. <laughs> no, sorry, it had been 12 months because I cut them at the hand tool Olympics in the previous Woodworking in America. And it was awful. Like I cut this terrible dovetail. It didn't help that there was like people standing there with cell phone cameras filming me like, oh, look, it's a Renaissance woodworker cutting dovetails. And I just screwed the pooch because I was like, I hadn't cut a dovetail in a year. And the last dovetail I cut was in this venue in like this timed environment. And it really wasn't all that good either. So there is definitely something to be said about every now and then pulling out a practice exercise and doing it. So yes, cutting dovetails can be a practice exercise. But I also find that there's a lot of other things that go into that. Um, I also don't like the idea of the typical two tail dovetail practice joint because fitting two tails is so much easier than fitting three tails, like exponentially easier than three tails, let alone four and five tails um, on, on, a, on a single joint. So if you are going to find yourself in a situation where you want to cut like a dovetail joint a day, make it a three tail joint at least. But I submit to you that cutting a dovetail joint a day is not actually going to be as effective than making 10 dovetail-like saw cuts over the course of five minutes. So, you know, you're cutting, cutting dovetails. You're going to cut this angle and that angle and that angle and that angle, and you're going to do that four times. Um, that's really the key to cutting dovetail joints. Not so much the angle, but cutting it square across the end grain. That's the key to getting good fitting dovetail joints. The rest of it's chiseling, and that has some of its own eccentricities. But if you were to take some time to make 10 saw cuts to a baseline, 
over two minutes, three minutes, you're going to gain so much more than taking 10 minutes to cut and fit a two dovetail joint um, because really it comes down to sawing more than anything else. So that's what I'm going to jump into today and I'm going to switch my cameras real quick, hopefully, or maybe not. That didn't work. That's because I haven't turned on the camera. <laughs> Silly little details. And by all means, if there are questions in the chat room, throw them at me. I'm, I'm all for it. Um, especially while I'm futzing around with this. There we go. So, um, saw bench and a bit of poplar and a saw. So, when it comes to rough sawing like this, when I'm dimensioning parts to size and I'm using a, a handsaw, the best thing that you can do is it's pretty simple. It's just make some saw cuts. But it's not a matter of just make, you know, a huge number of saw cuts and don't pay any attention. Don't just, you know, I'm going to mark out, uh, let's just do three lines. But I would recommend marking out 10 lines on this board. And it's not just make 10 cuts in quick succession. What you want to do is make the cut and then show a square to it and really examine how did my cut come out and where did it go wrong? Is it off square? Is it off plumb or in other words, off square around the thickness? Is it a straight cut or does it deviate at all? You also, I'm sure any of you can empathize with this. You're in the middle of a cut and you realize something's going wrong. And you make a little adjustment or you're listening to the saw and you hear that it's making a lot of noise and you make an adjustment midway through. Usually you can see those adjustments telegraphed into the cut quality or into the ability to follow the line. So you want to think about those things and make little adjustments along the way. So I'm just going to set up on this. make that cut. And as you're making the cut, you know, the first thing I noticed is the board shifted on me. That's because I didn't have it up against my knee. Proper cross cutting technique is you put whatever hand you're sawing with, the opposite knee goes on the board and then the board nestles up against the, the sawing knee, the standing leg, and it keeps it from moving forward and back. There are some saw benches I've seen that have hold fasten things. I don't like having to like unfasten or fasten anything. First of all, it just no, I mean, my bench is not thick enough for hold fast, but I want to actually be able to move the board around because as the board moves or if the board moves while I'm sawing, that's actually an indication of something that's going on while I'm sawing. If the board really, the force of the saw is primarily straight down. If the board starts shifting around, there's some binding going on in the saw that's causing it to move. And that tells me that something's off with my cut or my body mechanics. So restraining the board isn't actually that much of your friend when it comes time to make the cut. So I marked off of this edge. So let's just see. We are, this is not the right square for that. That's a layout square for a different purpose. So I am not exactly square. Question is, yeah, the line was square. I'm a little high here, but I, I, I can look at my line. I can see a little bit of, of graphite and see that I split the line and then I removed the line. So I actually drifted a little bit in and the cut's not exactly square. Okay, that's one thing. I can look at it in this direction and I am sawing plumb. And I could have basically told you that right off the cut just by listening to the saw. The saw wasn't making any extraneous rattle noises or vibration, which is indicative of a saw being off plumb one way or another. You'll hear it. So that's the other thing. You want to be listening to the saw. You want to be feeling the saw. How does the actual sawing action f um, feel? Should not feel hard. Um, it should just be kind of gliding through the cut. So I went off on my saw cut. I went in a little bit. Well, why is that? Well, Probably, I probably set up a little too far away from the saw cut. So I'm going to move my body in a little bit more, make sure that I've got my knee pressed up against this, and I'm going to repeat the cut. Now, there's the other thing. Just starting the cut can be uh, a real struggle for a lot of people. So over the course of these 10 cuts, 
starting 10 cuts, you'll, you'll learn a lot there. Now, I was getting a lot more vibration there, so I actually very subtly moved my elbow out, and it stopped that vibration. So it's highly possible that the start of the cut's going to be a little out of plumb, but ideally you should come into plumb as I went further back. Now this is sawing really easily. Very little effort required to make that cut. That ought to be bang on square. And that is bang on square. Is it plumb? It is plumb there, and sure enough, it's a little out of plumb down here. And that was that little bit of vibration I had at the beginning. I just wasn't paying attention. I started a little off. Really what it comes down to is I was focused on keeping square across the face, so I moved over a little bit, and I kind of squished my body up, and what it did is pulled the saw a little out of alignment. Once I just kind of readjusted to get rid of that sound, it, it came back to, uh, to a plumb cut. So I just made two cuts there, and I learned a little bit about what's, what's going wonky with you know, my body today, because it'll change. I mean, I had a... Um, um, recovering from a, a calf strain. So I had physical therapy first thing this morning and it's late enough in physical therapy that now physical therapy is just a really hard workout. So I had a hard workout in the morning and then I had a, a nice long run after that. So um, I'm a little bit stiff at this point. So my sawing technique is gonna be a little bit different than it would be you know, on a day where I didn't have a long run or something and I wasn't particularly feeling stiff or, or um, the joints needed to be lubricated. So that those body mechanics will change from time to time. And as you work through that exercise, I mean, call that an exercise. It's just making saw cuts, right? But it's making intelligent saw cuts and assessing at every single cut with a square. And be really anal retentive on this. Like, am I a little out of square or a lot out of square? Am I just a tiny bit out of square up here, but the rest is okay? You want to really pay attention to those things and think about what do I need to adjust? And when you see that the cut is out of plumb, Think back to that cut you just made, and that's why it's important to make this assessment after every cut, not make 10 cuts and then assess it from there, because obviously what good is that if you're cutting it off each time? That saw cut is fresh in your mind, and you can immediately think, okay, why would I have gone out of plumb? Did the saw make a lot of noise there? Did it feel hard? Did it feel like it was binding? Did my shoulder get like feel weird, like this is really tiring? Well, anytime the saw cut feels like it's exhausting, especially on something like an eight inch wide board like that, assuming the saw is sharp. You really shouldn't be getting physically fatigued, even over the course of making 10 saw cuts, especially if you're stopping for a minute or two in between, that's plenty of recovery time. I don't care how out of shape you are, you're not gonna really feel physically fatigued by doing this. But if you do feel like that hurt my shoulder or that hurt my tricep or something like that, that's an indication of poor body mechanics where you're forcing the saw through something. So make those 10 cuts and analyze each cut and make little tiny adjustments. Now, you may be wondering, well, how do I know what adjustments to make? Don't overthink it. If the saw cut goes out of plumb this way, like as I'm staring down, it goes out of plumb this way, lean back this way in order to, to write it. Because that's really all sawing is, is trying to keep that saw plate moving in a nice straight line. And if it started to curve out one way or another, it's probably because you're actually twisting one way or another, or as your saw arm is coming back, it's twisting out around your body in order to get around your torso. So that maybe means that you're crowding your sawing arm and you might need to step off a little bit and give yourself a little bit of sawing room. Nine times out of 10 though, just resetting up on the saw, you know, kneeling on, on the saw bench and setting up like you're about to saw or even making that little forward stroke to get the saw cut started and then just stop and trace the saw plate to your wrist, to your elbow, to your shoulder. If it's all on the same geometric plane, you're good to go. If it's not, if the elbow's kicking out or the shoulder's inside of the elbow, you need to make that adjustment. But what you need to do is make that adjustment into a comfortable position. If it's all wonky and then you're like, kind of tweak the elbow and shoulder into line and you're sitting here going, okay, this is awkward that the minute you start sawing, your body is going to get to a less awkward, more comfortable position. So you get your arm aligned and then reposition the rest of your body, however you need to do it, to be in a comfortable at rest and balanced position. That's the other thing. If you're leaning on the saw uh, on the board and you're kind of balancing, that's gonna fail you halfway through that saw cut. 
So position everything so that this is straight and nice and comfortable and then make the saw cut. And just pay attention every time you make that cut, what little tweaks can I make? That is actually, um, that's a, like a major utilitarian exercise because it literally warms you up. It raises your heart rate a little bit, gets the synovial fluid flowing and all the muscles in the joints and it gets you just ready to start working. But I find this is the hard part. You know, you've got a thousand and one things running through your mind. Just focus on that pencil line. The only thing that exists in the world is that pencil line. And how do I split that pencil line? And after a couple of cuts, the blinders come on and all that's left is that pencil line. And there, now your focus is good. It's meditation, really. This is our clubhouse. This is our, our, our yoga studio. This is where we come to be zen with the wood, right? So just going through that exercise will really help you kind of throw away the rest of the stuff, get you physically warmed up, but really get this tuning in the right way. 10 saw cuts. You can do the same thing with a rip cut. If you do find that you're struggling with rip cuts, I don't recommend making 10 rip cuts on, you know, on a 36 inch long board. That's a lot of work. It's also can be a lot of waste of wood, which it should also be very clear. What I recommend is going to a big box store and picking up like some two by material. Like the cheapest, junkiest two by eight, really two by eight is probably the best size. Now two by four is just too narrow for cross cuts. Two by eight is a good width. Two by 12 is just a little daunting and it can get a little bit more expensive. Just buy one and just keep it in the shop. And you're taking like a half inch slice off the end, you know, that's five inches total. You'll work your way through that, you know, eight foot, 10 foot, two by eight over the course of several weeks if you did it every single day. And you spent whatever it costs for a two by eight now. It's not a lot of money. As I said, you can do the same thing with a rip cut, but you'll find that it's the exact same exercise, exactly what I just did with cross cutting, just examining it over a longer distance. But if you do find that ripping is something you're just terrible at, I cannot keep that saw cut plumb, the saw is constantly wandering, then it's worth picking up a two by eight or even a two by 10 and just making one inch increment lines and sawing those lines. But really, cross cut it down to 24 inches. You're not there to try to work on your endurance. You know, you want to be able to make that cut like in a minute. Um, and 24 inches with a sharp saw, that's easily done in a minute, probably more like 20 to 30 seconds, especially in a softwood. So um, don't be just like cutting up, you know, nice expensive lumber. I, I think I don't have to, I don't need to say that, but just in case people think, oh, he's just gonna start tearing into stuff. You notice that I used a piece of poplar. And moreover, that is a piece of, of uh, case hardened, poorly dried poplar that I can't use in a project because Actually, if I tried to rip that, I would probably pinch on the saw plate because it's, it was a kiln defect. So that works for ripping and cross cutting, same thing. Um, just to shake things up a little bit, let's talk about some planing. Um, I've got really two exercises that I stand by when it comes to planing. And I got too many cords catching on things in the shop. Um, there's a bunch of different planing exercises. One of the favorite ones that I had um, when I was learning was from Chuck Bender and that was actually uh, take a board and make a dowel out of it, which is kind of one of those annoying projects because <laughs> it's like, this is why am I doing this? <laughs> what is the purpose? When am I ever going to do this in a project? But it really teaches you precision. And actually, if you ever get into a situation where you're making octagonal legs like this, being able to, to take a square board into an octagon and into a 16 sided piece and into a 32-sided piece, which is pretty much a dowel. There's certainly merit to that. But the number one issue I find with people when they're planing is poor weight transfer. And I'm going to just use my jack plane here today because it's like the most common plane. Just about every person who has ever picked up a plane, and certainly um, a thousand and one people who have emailed me this week, and said, I'm having trouble planing, I always end up with this problem. And that problem is the board, as they're planing, the board ends up being thinner on the far side than on the near side. Some instances is the opposite. It's thinner on the near side than on the far side. Or I'm unable to get a full length shaving. The, the, the plane is skipping at the end or at the beginning, sometimes skipping in the middle, that's an issue of just not being flat. But nine times out of 10, the issues people are having is poor weight transfer on the plane. So. Ideally, what we want is that even transfer of weight. When the plane starts cutting, most of the weight is here on the knob. 
when the blade enters the board, you start to transfer back. But the way I like to think of it is, until the tote crosses the threshold, until the tote comes over the board, keep your weight focused on that knob. Once the tote comes onto the board, you want kind of even pressure between both hands, between the tote and the knob. Then, once the tail of the plane enters the board, you can pretty much take the weight off the knob. Now, you'll see some people say you can just take it off and just finish the cut one-handed. Yes, you can do that, but I also find that, um, especially when you're getting started, you tend to lose some control of the plane, and you don't realize that you might want a little bit more weight out here, so it, it stops cutting sometimes, or it kind of goes wonky and skews because you don't have a hand that's steering out in front of it. So weight on the knob, even weight between the two, and then very little weight on the knob, most of the weight on the tote. But here's the real issue. It's more than just having the weight on the tote. There's kind of almost a, a downward twist to it to really reference the tail. And this is to make sure that you're really getting a flat board here because you very easily can put too much weight out here on the knob and take a deeper cut. Now, I've made no adjustments to this plane. So ideally, it's taking the same thickness of shaving from one side to the other. And this board is out of flat. So let's just try to flatten it out first so that it at least is giving us consistent readings. There, we'll hide there. That's the other thing. If you can't get full like shavings, it's probably because you've got a section that's out of flat. So now I've got something that's somewhat flat. Now, if I come in here and I put a lot of weight on the toe, let's make a heavier cut here, put a lot of weight on the toe and really keep that weight on the toe all the way to the end, first thing that's going to happen is more than likely the plane is going to tip. As that knob comes off the end, you're going to get a little tip. Well, that can certainly round over the end, but also the reason it's tipping is because you've got a lot of weight out there. And if I pull out this shaving, here's a perfect example. I don't know if I can unroll this because it's kind of thin already, but you'll see it's very, very thin to the point where it's actually coming apart into like individual strings down at the end because it's super thin. It's probably half a thousandth of an inch thick out here. But as I come back to the other side, it's holding together more completely because now I'm actually about a thou and a half thick down the last part that came out. And that was just from putting, there's about a thousandth of an inch difference. They tell me that the fingers can feel the difference between a thousandth of an inch. This is definitely thinner, whatever it is to this. I'm just looking at the, the opacity of it and I've planed a lot of pine. It's probably about a thousandth of an inch difference from this end of the board to this end of the board. And that was just sheer weight transfer. No adjustment on the plane, and yet it's taking a deeper cut because I'm putting more weight on it. The other thing that's coming from this, can I back out here a little bit? Yeah. Um, there's some footwork element going on here too that needs to be considered. As you are making a planing pass, and especially on a short board like this, a lot of people will set up, kind of set their feet in place and make the pass, and your feet don't move. And for a short board, that's okay, but even then, I deepened my plane cut there a little bit so that the shaving's not falling apart on me. But I can unroll it again, and I can definitely feel this side and this side are different. This side is a little bit thicker over here than it is over here. And again, it's from too much weight on the top. And because I'm planting my feet and not moving them, as I come to the end of this cut, Look how stretched out my body is at this point. My legs are all the way back here, and my arms are almost fully extended. First of all, this is hard on the back. Second of all, all of your weight is now being pushed forward onto this knob, which is the other reason why that plane wants to kind of tip off the edge. But if I start this cut and step forward, this leg stepped across and stepped forward. Now, when I finish this cut, look at this. This elbow is almost 90 degrees. As compared to where I was before, where the elbow is almost fully extended, when I step forward now, my elbow is pretty much in line with my torso or my center of gravity. 
And what that's really done is it's driven the weight down into the tail of the plane that's going to produce an even shaving. And this is where, you know, video fails us because you guys just have to trust my, uh, my sense of touch here. But as if I unroll this, I've got a very consistent shaving from one end to the other. In fact, if I hold that up to the light, you can really see, I mean, you guys can't see, but the, uh, the shaving is the same thickness from one to the other. Now, let me be clear. The difference is minor. Like, you know, as I was really leaning into that, the difference was maybe a thousandth of an inch. That's not really going to telegraph into the board, but if you make five, six, seven plane passes like that on a board, now you're talking six thousandths of an inch difference. And now suddenly this board is thinner on one end than it is in the other. Or what you sometimes have happen is you've just created a hump, you've created a banana here. You've actually planed a curve using a flat sole just by not using proper weight transfer. So the best way to teach this is grab a board. We're just going to move to an edge because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to complicate issues by, by having a board at a flat across the width. You just want to be able to grab an edge that you can get the entire, um, the entire width or thickness of the board in one plane pass. Make a saw cut. This is probably about 28 inches long. I would say at least 24, 36 inches would be a good length. One third from the end, make a cross cut and then just split it out. So what I've got here is a notch. This edge, you know, you can see I split it, so I'm not even surface, but the key is, is substantially lower from that notch on. And either set it on your bench in like a wedge with a planing stop or secure it in a vise, however you want to do that. And now you're going to make this plane pass. And the tendency will be, especially with so much of this board at a lower level, the tendency will be for it to want to dip down like that. So you can see the toe is resting on that lower section and it kind of jumped right off that notch. And in these instances, trying to zoom in a little bit here, this can be really difficult to get a flat edge. If my goal was to remove this high spot and joint this into one long edge, I'm going to start removing more and more material here and it's going to kind of slope down into this wedge and it's going to give me this real low spot right in the middle that can be difficult to overcome. So what you want to focus on doing is wait on the knob as we enter the cut and then when the tote is firmly on the board, I'm not going to take my hand off here, but I'm going to kind of tweak my wrist down. You see how it's pulling down and I'm almost taking my palm and resting it on the sole of the plane. Now there's not really a lot of pressure, but it just changes the force angle. Instead of it being slightly up and down, if you look at my finger, you see my fingers pointing down a little bit. If I rotate my wrist down, my finger is still pointing down, but it's pointing at a lower angle. It's pointing more straight out in front of me. You can even point your finger straight out in front of you. And you'll find that as I exit that cut, it didn't immediately dip down. Let's try that again. Rotate the wrist down and finish off the cut. And what ends up happening is you get this feeling that you're kind of taking off at the end of the board. As you come off the edge, there's not so much weight on the knob that the, you're fighting the tendency for it to come down. You're actually lifting off like an airplane. <laughs> Yay. The other thing is, and you can't really see it from the angle of the camera, but I'm also starting this whole cut with a step forward as I make it. And it's just, I mean, obviously I don't step forward, pause, and then make the cut. What I do is rely upon my forward momentum by stepping forward right into the cut. And that gives me a nice smooth start to the cut. It also puts all of the force of the planing into your hips and your legs and your glutes, which is going to last a heck of a lot longer than your shoulders and everything. But continuing this cut and essentially working this board into one flat um, plane is going to require 
that weight transfer to the back, to the tail, so that the plane does not just rock off. And you can actually make this more complicated by going, putting the notch like halfway down the board. And, you know, if the notch was halfway down the board and then I go at it with, you know, a smaller plane, well, that kind of defeats the purpose, right? You want to use a longer plane like a jack or even use a joiner plane. The idea being that the large, the, the lion's share of that plane is hanging off that edge. And the gra gravity wants to pull it down, but your weight transfer and your planing technique is holding it in that geometric plane. This is a fantastic exercise. It's something, again, you can use with a bit of pine. Um, and I don't know that I would make a notch quite as deep as I did here. This is almost a quarter of an inch deep. Because um, the, the real fun comes as you get closer and closer. And now, maybe the plane is starting to graze the wood in front of it, but keeping that this plane back here the same and not rounding it over and lowering it down into this one. It's a really good exercise. The other thing is, is every time you're making this cut, you also can learn a lot about your ability to edge joint just by paying attention to the shaving, to the shape of the shaving. This shaving, as you can see, if I can lift it up without moving the shaving, First of all, it's a full width shaving, but it's also right in the middle of the plane, which is where I want it to be. It's not skewed to one side or the other. Um, as I pull it out, I can also examine that this is giving me a consistent thickness throughout. It's also giving me a nice full width. Oops, I just broke it. <laughs> but here again, examining the shaving, the shape of the shaving, the thickness of the shaving, but the position of the shaving in the mouth, which is why you'll find that I can be pretty anal retentive about removing the shaving after every pass. Sometimes I get a little lazy and I'll make several passes, but you really want to be able to see where that shaving is coming out of the mouth as you're making that. That in and of itself is its own practice exercise because if it's shifting one way or another, you can be throwing some external kind of lateral motion in your planing technique, which is only just gonna make things more complicated. So that exercise can then be translated to face work. And this piece of pine will work for now. Here, what I want to do is, using a pencil or lumber crayon, whatever you have, is make a series of lines down the board. And you can do this actually with a rough sawn board um, and work on several different planes. If you have a four plane or a scrub plane um, and a joiner plane or a jack plane, you can start with a rough sawn board and do the same exercise with the lines on the rough sawn using your four plane or your scrub plane and work in getting a consistent shaving length with the four plane. It's, that's kind of a tertiary skill to have because the four plane is really all about sculpting the wood anyway. It's not really about making full length passes. But where this comes into play is once you've got a board that's in that flattish state and you're trying to joint it, you want to be able to remove this line in one pass. And this line will immediately tell you if you've got inconsistencies in your planing pass at all. So as I make this cut, I didn't get the whole line. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's kind of a lot of, lot of white on there. Let's get a little closer and a little higher on that. So that far line, there is, I removed here and here and here and here, but I've left some of the line there and some of the line there. Now, is this, the board is out of flat? I don't know. I don't think so. It looks pretty flat to me. No, well, that's pretty flat. This is the other thing is as you're doing this, you don't want, you could set the, I could, you know, advance this cut even more, make an even heavier cut, and there's no possible way to skip the line. Like, no matter what you do, if you crank down on it, you're going to remove the line because you're taking such a heavy amount. But with, I would call this kind of maybe light, um, 
We'll call this a heavy light shaving. This would be heavy duty work for a smoothing plane, so it's probably a little light for the jack plane. Let me just do about a quarter rotation there. Oh, I put my lumber crayon back. And I'll put my line back and see if I can do this again. All right, with a little heavier cut, I was able to move the whole thing, but I've still got a little bit of a little hint of a line right there. So something, something screwy is going on. I have a feeling we just have a low spot on the board. Let's try this line next to it, because if I keep planing in this place, what I'm going to do is actually lower this end of the board, and it's going to affect my ability to get a, a, a flat cut all the way across the board. There, that was great. Now this is probably, this little spot I'm skipping is probably indicative of a slight hump. Because as I came along here, I was kind of on the crown of the board and I actually took too wide of a cut there and I removed part of my line there. But I, without a problem, removed that line in one pass. I probably will have the same situation here, but I might run into some skip here around this knot where this knot is going to be a high spot, no doubt. And sure enough, you can see I skipped the line here because I actually felt the plane kind of go up over the knot and it missed and skipped the rest of the board. Now I could probably fix that by paying a little bit more attention to my weight throughout the cut. No, <laughs> not that way. Oh, let's make this cut first. See what happened there? I tried to make the same pass in the same place and I had to make a cut over here. So what ended up happening is I almost had like a ledge on the far side that was holding the plane at an angle rather than holding it flat and allowing me to take that cut. So ideally, now that I've removed the high spot here, I should be able to come back and make that cut. And focusing a little bit more weight on the knob, as I hit the knot, instead of it kind of bouncing up over the knot and missing, I just plowed right through the knot. And actually looking at the knot, it was kind of dull before. Now it's a nice, shiny, well plain surface. And I removed that whole line. But just these, what was that, four lines? Tells me a heck of a lot about what's going on with my plane stroke, but also what's going on with the topography of this board. So ideally, I've made passes all the way across this board. I ought to be able to come back here and remove this in one pass with good weight transfer. And the line is gone. So now, try again. Missed it. Something went screwy there. Why is that? I honestly don't know. Let's put the line back on and let's move on and just see. Okay, same thing where it went up over that knot. So now, a little bit more pressure, some downward pressure on the knob, and that helps me remove those lines. So it's a real tiny thing to change the weight distribution, but you see the tiniest little weight distribution is still, even though you think you're getting that full length shaving, the lumber crayon doesn't lie. And it's leaving little traces behind and it's showing you that your plane is actually skipping. Some of that can be due to um, poor body mechanics, improper weight transfer on the board. Some of it can, can be due to the topography of the board. Some of it is just, you didn't stick your tongue out at the right angle or you didn't hold your breath at the right, I mean, it's just little tiny nuances because we are talking about relatively thin shavings, but the troubleshooting and the problem solving that comes from when I don't remove the line, well, why is that? Let's think about why this is. You also very quickly understand how important it is to be consistent as you plane across a board, the side-by-side -side cuts and actually being able to stack and overlap those cuts as you work across the board. If you're not doing that, you'll end up with um, flatness issues across the width that don't allow you to remove that line. This is probably the number one planing exercise. The only issue is, is it does, as I say, it does require a somewhat flat board to start with. So if you're buying big box lumber, um, make it easier on yourself and buy six inches or narrower lumber. That's not going to have quite so much cup to it. But, you know, learning on a flattened board is part of the whole process anyway, right? So just by putting lines on the board, you'll be able to see as you're making those plane passes where the high spots are and where you need to remove more. You could even go so far as to put a grid on there and help flatten the whole thing out. But 
that's getting a little overkill. Um, the idea with this is something real quick, remove the whole line. If you didn't remove the whole line, nine times out of 10, it's a weight transfer issue. If you start with rough sawn lumber and you're using your scrub plane, I think you'll find you'll be able to remove the line with very little effort just because the scrub's taking such a heavy cut. But you also can go from rough to a you know, plain board and then try this again once you've got that flat surface. It's really, really beneficial to teach you how to make sure that you're removing an even amount of wood from one end to the other just by using lumber crayon. Um, I don't recommend, I like lumber crayon or, or, or pencil here. Don't use like a pen uh, because the pen's actually going to dent the wood, especially something soft like pine. And don't use Sharpie because it's actually going to soak into the wood a little bit more. And it can be even harder to remove those lines. And you're, you're like, you think you're removing it, but there's still a line there. It's because it's actually soaked through. So lumber crayon or pencil is preferred here. Um, that's not going to, to dent the wood, but also not soak through. So yeah. Uh, no, as far as I know, there is no difference between a lumber crayon and a kid's crayon other than um, the lumber crayon is, is man-sized. <laughs> big, big, um, I mean, this is a, a barely used lumber crayon. I mean, it's still the same thing. Maybe there's some sort of chemical change in the wax or something like that, but it just gives you a, a blunter point. Um, I'll, a kid's crayon that's going to be sharp and finer may have more of a tendency to break on a rough sawn board because that's really where lumber crayons are for is for marking rough boards. So you've got this big blunt tip that's not going to break and tear apart on a rough sawn board like that. That's really their intent. I just happen to have like six of them floating around the shop in pretty colors. So I use those more than anything. I usually have one in my apron pocket and somehow it's not anymore. Oh, there it is. It's over there. So yeah. Um, next. Um, let's go into some finer work here. Um, the, the sawing exercise that I did really applies to, you know, ripping, cross-cutting. The same thing would apply to, like, more precise cutting at, like, a bench hook using a back saw. So you could take your board, lay out 10 lines across it, and repeat that process at a bench hook. Exact same thing, examine how the cut came out on the end. Um, like I said, exact same process, but worthwhile doing because a back saw is going to require slightly different body mechanics. Working at a bench hook, obviously I'm up, I'm up higher, um, so there's different body mechanics going on there, and you may find that you're struggling with that skill, um, but you're fine with the typical cross cutting or ripping. Moreover, if you, do, if you don't have a saw bench, or maybe you're unable to, to kneel on a saw bed, or you've got knee problems or something like that, and you do your ripping and cross-cutting up higher, standing up at a workbench, you can do the same process. You want to be doing that exercise however you're normally going to saw. But the point being, I can do that exact same exercise with a back saw, and I do definitely recommend that as well. But as you move into joinery, I talked earlier about how the dovetails can be learned not just by cutting a bunch of dovetails but by cutting dovetail light cuts so i'm going to lay out these are just square lines across the board if you're finding yourself really struggling cutting angles. You can lay in some angles on here as well. I find that assuming you're cutting tails first, the angle is really not that important because you're just going to transfer that angle onto the pin board. What is most important in getting dovetails that fit well is the squareness of the cut, the squareness of the tail. If the tail is off square, it becomes a wedge in a bad way. Um, well, if it's wedged in a good way, that's a big old gap in your dovetail. If it's wedged, you know, so that it gets thicker as you drive it in, it's going to split your board as you seat it. And that's bad. You don't want that at all. So what's most important is really getting this cut straight across the board. And I do find that in most joinery instances, it's not a bad idea to put a baseline in either. And you know what? You guys can't see those lines that I laid out. So let's flip the board around so that you can see them. Um, you could put a baseline in if, 
if hitting your baseline or going past your baseline is something that is kind of a, a constant pain point for you, then it's worth, uh, um, it's worth throwing in a baseline and, and training yourself to stop at that line. But really, this is about making a bunch of saw cuts. And actually what I find, I don't normally saw dovetails where I'm standing right now, so make sure I don't hit my elbow into my chisel rack behind me. What I find, uh, hand tool school guys are gonna be tired of hearing me say this, but the, the secret I think to good joinery cuts in general, but especially dovetail cuts, is committing to that cut. You'll find a lot of people who will kind of nibble their way across the board. First of all, you're using like one inch of the sawtooth, and that's gonna end up becoming a real dull spot in your saw. But this, I mean, especially the stiletto dovetail saw, it's a 12 inch dovetail plate. There's a reason for that. It's a nice, long 12 inch straight plate. If I use that straight plate by making a full length pass, the straightness of the saw is going to translate to a straight cut. If I make a bunch of little nibbling cuts, I can actually saw a curve into this board because I'm shortening the wheelbase, if you will, and I end up with a really wonky cut. So why would you want to start your dovetails with this little cut? The best way to do it is to actually set up on the line and commit to that cut. That first stroke needs to be full length, but also with, with some commitment. You know, there, there's none of this mm, kind of working your way across. No, I'm committed. And that's going to set you up nice and square. Of course, it occurs to me, I can't see my lines, but curious. Eh, pretty good, actually. <laughs> I'd much rather be able to see my lines to saw to my lines, but uh, there's the rule number one. Uh, hand tool woodworking is just working to a line, but it's helpful to be able to see the line. So again, you line up on this, start that cut. Am I on the line? Look at that, I'm on the line. And finish it off. Now, um, there's really no way to do this and still be able for everyone to see the lines. But a lot of times joinery cuts can be broken into multiple steps. So again, the most important part of the dovetail is getting the squareness of the cut. So I'll set up on there, I pinch the wood so I can line my, um, press my dovetail saw against it, commit to that cut, and I know I've, I just split my line right on the top. It's nice and square. Now the next part is, is to hit the angle. If there's an angle on the face, or if I'm sawing a box joint, or even when I'm sawing a tenon, getting the line down the face. So now that I've got it nailed across the top, I will drop my handle and I'll focus on just the line on the face hitting that line and staying square to it all the way down. So it's a two-step process. And in doing this practice cut and repeating it over and over again, you can very quickly start to hone in on maybe where you're going wrong with the saw cut and how do I line up my cuts to, um, how do I change my body position how do I change my process? Do I need to commit to the cut more? Do I need to uh, actually steer the cut as I'm making the cut down the face? But just the process of going through those 10 cuts, that's gonna teach you more about dovetailing than cutting a dovetail joint a day. I guarantee you this will get you a lot more. Um, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how you know, you cut those tenons, you feel great, but then you don't cut tenons again for three months or whatever. Um, cutting dovetails, cutting a dovetail joint, even in that microcosm of that single dovetail joint a day, you'll make those, if it's a two dovetail joint, you'll make those eight angled cuts, and then that's it. You know, then you're on to chiseling out the waist, and then you're over to making the, the cuts on the, um, the pin board, but those are different cuts. Those are not angled. Those are angled across the board, which is, pretty easy, a heck of a lot easier to deal with because you're still sawing plumb. You're not having to fight gravity's tension by sawing at an angle there. But again, you only made like eight or nine cuts in that entire joint and you spent a bunch of other time, the line share of the time, I would say with the chisel in your hand, trying to work down to that baseline and get everything to fit really well from there. What does that actually teach you about dovetail joinery? Certainly it teaches you how to fit a joint. But anybody will tell you the best dovetail joints are the ones that fit right off the saw. Dovetailing is not a chiseling op operation. It is a sawing operation. And the minute you can get your joints to fit right off the saw, 
you know, you don't have to mess around with the chisel anymore. So you should be focusing on the sawing, not the chiseling work. So just deconstruct the dovetail joint into a practice exercise that is just a bunch of saw cuts. And the goal should be to split those lines every single time. When you get to the point where you can split that line, now leave the line. But saw to the right of the line and leave it. And then saw to the left of the line and leave it. You know, you really can start to pick and choose how much waste do I leave? Because as the softness or the compressibility of the board changes, in other words, the species of the board changes, the way you saw your dovetails is going to change as well. There was a question in the chat room about skewing, um, skewing the plane. What about skewing the plane? Uh, it would be planing very straight. Yes, in that exercise where I'm removing the line, I am absolutely planing very straight. There's, where'd that board go? Oh, I'm sawing it. There, <coughs> There's really no reason to skew the plane um, when you're, you're working with the grain like this. If you have um, particularly figured wood or something like that, there are reasons to skew the plane, but that's an issue to control tear out. We're not talking about tear out here. We're talking about weight transfer. We're talking about being able to remove that full line. So that's the other thing. If you've got a highly figured board, I hope you're not using it as a practice board for a practice exercise. That's why I just use regular old pine here. Um, most of the planing I do is with a straight plane. The only time I skew the plane is if I'm trying to maybe bring an edge into square, I'm working on an edge, and I'll skew it in order to put more weight on one side to make a deeper cut, or I'm trying to relieve tear out. But I'm relieving tear out at the smoothing plane side of things. At that point, it's not about flattening anymore. It's the board is already flat, and now I'm just making it pretty. And now I'm skewing the plane in order to remove um, any tear out. And, and lower, essentially, effectively lower the cutting angle to make tear out, um, to remove more tear out. This is not about tear out at all. And there's really no reason to be skewing a jointer plane. Because the jointer plane is not about making a tear out free surface, it's about making a flat surface. And the minute you start skewing it, you saw how very easily taking that one pass and then not taking the pass adjacent to it, how that actually threw off my cut. So if you're skewing the plane, now the tail is running out over this board that's actually higher than the spot, this part that I just planed. And you're very quickly going to start taking your board out of flat. So I do not recommend skewing the plane unless you're specifically trying to remove tear out. Skewing the plane also can be a crutch for when the blade starts to get dull. If you find that you're having to skew the plane just to get it to cut, you've got to go sharpen. There's something wrong with the, with the sharpness of your blade. And, and that, having to make that change is a, is a clear indication of that. So hope that answers the question there. Uh, can you describe the way you think about taking weight off the tip of the saw for the first cut? Sure. Um, the, the real answer is I don't think about it um, because it's second nature at this point. But some of it, I will say, is we can blame the saw. This handle fits my hand so incredibly well that I really don't need these other fingers. It kind of just balances in my hand. So some of that is the lower horn of this handle is already perfectly cradling my palm. But as I line up for the cut, first, you know, I, I pinch the wood in order to hold the, the saw plate in place. I will ever so slightly think about applying pressure from my palm into the lower horn of the handle. And what that does is it unweights the toe and allows me to start not only in the push stroke, but in one consistent cut. If I angle my hand down, it stutters as it starts. I'm, I'm essentially not putting weight on the toe, or excuse me, the, the lower horn of this handle, and that's allowing gravity to take over and pull this down. So you really, you don't want to necessarily tweak your wrist up because that's throwing everything out of alignment, but you want to as you set up, you want to make sure that you can feel that lower horn. Make sure you feel your palm pressing into that lower horn. And actually, one of the best ways, this is a Rob Cosman trick, actually. One of the best ways, another practice exercise to do this is set up on the board, press your, your palm into that lower horn, and just start taking a cut. And ideally, if I squeeze my fingers, I'm actually sliding the saw back and forth. Let me get a little closer here. So I'm taking the, the weight off the saw so it's not touching. But as I squeeze and pinch my fingers, you can see how the saw is moving laterally. So now if I press my palm into that lower horn and start sawing, I can actually saw like 
a little dado in the top of this board. And this saw plate, because there's no weight on the toe, it just skates laterally back and forth. The minute I start taking the weight off, it starts to stutter and it won't, it won't move back and forth on me. So you can start to take the weight off and feel it skate across the board a lot more and release, release the weight so that it starts to stick and stutter on there. And that really, you start to feel the difference. And you can actually get pretty aggressive while still removing the weight off the board and cut like a big old divot into your board that way. So the, I guess the answer is it's, it's less making an adjustment and more about thinking about making an adjustment. It's a subtle thing, but again, with a well-fit handle, you're gonna feel that lower horn anyway, but with a handle that's necessarily not well-fit and a, a typical handsaw like this is not gonna have a well-fit handle because this is a mass-produced saw, but as I'm setting up to start a cut with this saw, I will, in some instances, almost tweak my wrists a little bit to unweight that toe. And the more difficult woods you work with, AKA the really, really hard jungle woods, you'll find that you have to like physically kind of tweak your wrist in order to take the weight off so that it starts that way. Um, that's a, another exercise within this little dovetail sawing exercise that'll teach you a lot there, that little sawing a dado thing, or just starting that cut cleanly. Every time you make that cut, if you find yourself struggling to start it, you gotta step back and think, okay, what am I doing? What am I doing wrong here? How do I unweight that toe a little bit more? Um, and then, similar joinery exercise would be tenons. And let's face it, there are a lot more tenons in furniture than there are dovetails. So being able to saw a tenon, I think, is a lot more important. Where's my wheel gauge? Oh, it's over there. This is what happens when you don't put tools back where they're supposed to go, folks. You can't find them. If I lay out a tenon, I'm not, I'm not going to lay out a full tenon. I'm essentially lay out a half lap here. Um, this cut is, first of all, it's a lot longer than your typical dovetail cut. That's one of the saving graces of dovetails is generally you don't have to make a super, super long cut because it's only the thickness of a board. But once you move to tenons, ideally you've got a tenon saw. You're not trying to saw your dovetails or saw your tenons with a, a dinky little dovetail saw. It's possible, but it's a lot like work. The minute you go to a tenon saw, it's obviously a different body mechanics, a different amount of weight because this is, I've just gone from a 12 inch saw to an 18 inch saw and a heck of a lot bigger saw that myth, uh, for that matter. So there's a lot more weight that I'm wielding here. But that whole idea of when I'm sawing the dovetail, sawing across the end grain and then making a separate cut down the face is really important with tenons because it's so important that I get that thickness right across the end grain, but then I also follow that nice long line. If it's a three inch long bridle joint or four inch long tenon for a bridle joint, you gotta make sure you're following that line or you're gonna have a lot of cleanup to do or you're gonna have a tenon that's wildly loose. You know, maybe it fits right at the tip, but it's super loose down on the inside. You're sacrificing glue strength, and if it's a bridle joint where the whole thing's visible, it just looks ugly. So this is the same thing. You know, it's a little bit harder to line up, you know, 10 different cuts here, but you can on a, you know, a, this is a, about seven eighths of an inch thick board here, but I could probably make four different tenon cuts on this one board. So if I went to the big box store and I bought some two by material, that same stuff that I was making cross cuts on, I could probably lay out five, six, maybe even seven tenon cuts on there and, and make those all in quick succession, kind of paying attention to what you learned along the way. So here again, I will line up on the cut using my fingers, pinching the wood just to give me kind of a back, backstop to push the saw against, thinking about unweighting that toe and committing to that first cut. Now I've got an 18 inch saw plate that's really keeping me straight. And you can either commit to the line on the face, in other words, down the length of the cheek, or you can commit to the top. I tend to prefer to cut across the top and really focus on getting the ingrain sawn right. Because it's a little bit more awkward. And I've got this board set up too high um, for this particular demonstration. It should be a little bit lower just so that I'm not tweaking my wrist. But once 
I get that cut across, I can now use that cut kind of as training wheels to keep my saw in line across the thickness as I now work down the face. And this is a slightly different body mechanic, right? And I just tweaked my saw because I moved my body as I was saying that. So now, as I hit the line or the end of my line, now I can flip this around. And while I'm not making the same cut across the end grain, I do want to make the same cut down the face. And I don't have a line on this face, so I'm just going to make it up. But really, if I'm letting my saw run in the kerf that already existed, I should be following the same line. I should be coplanar here. If the saw is starting to bind dramatically, I'm forcing it to follow a line that's not coplanar to the kerf that I just created. So that exercise, if you will, I hate to even call that an exercise because that's sawing a tenon. But just that series of cuts going through that process of work across the end grain down the face, that, that's the key to cutting good tenons. That's a two-step cut there, really three, because then you flip it around, four, really, because now you're flattening it out along the, along the shoulder. But making five or six of those in quick succession will really warm you up and really get you ready to, to saw accurately. This works great for dovetails, actually probably even better for dovetails because there's a lot more sawing here. So um, cross-cutting, ripping, back saw work, planing, the two planing ones. Yeah, that's, there's, there's a, a couple more, but those are the ones that I continually go back to. Anytime I'm lining up to, I know that I'm going to do a bunch of tendon work, I will just lay out you know, three, four cuts on the end of the board to make those tendon cuts, and it's just the perfect thing to warm me up. Likewise, if I'm cutting a bunch of dovetails, just make like 10 cuts here, and you're good to go. Um, the sawing exercises are, I think, particularly beneficial because you can do them really in, in quick succession to one another, and you can really hone your sawing ability in a matter of 20 minutes. Um, and I say that to a lot of people who are just getting started. They're like, man, I, it's going to take me forever to practice and get better with sawing. And I say, just give yourself 20 minutes. 20 minutes of nothing but sawing. That's a long time. You're going to be tired. And you're going to think about the last time you, you ripped a board. Did you actually run that saw back and forth in the wood for 20 minutes straight? That's a heck of a long time. That's a functional threshold power test on the bike. That's a long, lot of work. So if you've taken 20 minutes and just done nothing but sawing, your sawing skill will improve so dramatically in that 20 minutes. Now you're going to forget it all over the course of a week of not sawing, but the more you do that, the more you can kind of tap into that, that muscle memory, those body ingrams, those muscle ingrams that get built into our, our chemistry and, and just the, the muscle fibers firing. They're called ingrams. You remember these things and you quickly get back into it three or four cuts and now I'm back. You know, I'm super Sawyer again. You know, the next thing you know, just a couple of cuts and you're back into it. So that constant ability to, to repeat the cut very quickly is great for sawing. The planing ones, there's a lot more subtlety involved there. Um, but as you can see, just as I was going through that exercise of removing the line, all the little things that I'm learning about the board and about what I'm doing with my planing pass and my planing, my, my weight transfer, it's huge. Um, you just got to listen. And that's the, the biggest issue that I see with people sawing and people planing is they just bowl, just bowl through it. You know, they're not paying attention to what it is they're doing. They're not stopping to assess the quality of the cut. And more, any, more than anything with planing, they're just planing too much. You know, you end up with a strong taper on a board because you didn't stop after three passes to assess how you were doing. You just kept planing. Planning's fun, I get it, but uh, yeah, it's a lot harder to correct an issue 10 cuts later than it could be to correct an issue only three cuts in. So, um, how do I stop or reduce blowout on the backside of cross cuts? Um, figure out how important it is. Um, if you're using uh, a handsaw, you're gonna get blowout. This saw is not designed to give you a finish ready surface. Um, this is better than some of the other saws I have. If I wanted to have a saw like this that gave me little to no blowout on the backside, I would have a finer pitch and I would have more fleam on the saw. So my teeth are acting more like knives than chisels. Um, but a saw like this that's eight points per inch is still going to produce blowout on the backside. 
as you get to a dovetail saw, here is, see this is what happens when I don't actually see the lines I'm sawing. So you can see this little tear out down at the bottom, but this is just because it's the end of the cut. See those little strings sticking out there? That's just the end of the cut. But if you look, there's little to no tear on the back side of that cut because this was done with a dovetail saw. This was done with a saw designed to not leave tear out. It is, it's a finer pitch. It's not that fine. I mean, this is a um, 16, 16, no, this is a 15 points per inch saw, but it's also got, um, I've got about five degrees of fleam on here. So I've got a little more knife cuts going on. It's easing the passage of the saw through the back side of the wood. Um, the tiny bit of blowout I've got on the back of this cut would be planed away with a smoothing plane and maybe one or two passes. So if you are in a situation where, man, I'm getting blowout in the back of my cut, does it matter? Like what's the next step? If I'm cross cutting a roughs on board, I'm going to get blowout and I don't care because what I'm going to do from there is then plane the board and the planing is going to remove that tear out. Um, if I am further on down the line and say I've got to cross cut this rail or style to length and I get blow on the back of the board, do I care? Probably not because if it's a rail or style, there's probably going to be a tenon on the end. So the blowout that I'm getting there is going to be invisible because I'm just going to end up sawing away parts of the tenon later. Um, the only time you have to worry about a blowout on the back of the cut really is a through cut. Well, how many times do we make through cuts in the typical course of a project? Usually it's either sizing parts to size in which there's usually a plane following up afterwards. If you need a precisely sized panel, then you're bringing to bear like a shooting board or a plane regardless to, to finesse those edges. And that's going to remove that tear out. But this is also why panel saws exist. So I've got a rough saw on board that I'm breaking down to size. I'm going to use my rougher cross cut. This is my typical eight points per inch cross cut saw. It will leave some tear out. I then planed that board down to thickness. I've got two parallel edges. I've sized it close to size and say it's a floating panel that's going to go in a, in a door somewhere. Uh, now I need to get it to exact size. And I don't want to have huge blowout because then I don't want to have to plane past that blowout. So now I go to a more delicate saw. So the first solution is just to, um, to increase the number of teeth, to increase the pitch. I'm going from eight points per inch down to a uh, 12 points per inch crosscut saw. No, sorry. Yeah, this is 12 points per inch crosscut saw. So just by changing, almost doubling the number of teeth, I'm going to get a cleaner cut and I'm going to get less blowout on the backside. This will still give me some tear out on the backside, but again, something that can be cleaned up with a plane in the next step with a couple of passes. So that there, while I suppose it's possible to create a saw that creates zero tear out on the backside, you probably will be sacrificing some efficiency along the way. The more fleam you put on the teeth, the less tear out you're gonna get, but also the faster those teeth will dull because the more fleam means you've got a steeper angle and a less durable tooth. There's less steel behind the tooth and you've got this really, really fine point that's gonna fold over with very little work. So it's all a balancing act. Um, but I think more than anything, a blowout on the backside of the cut is, it's just something that, it's gonna happen. And you just have to think what other work is happening down the line. And if it's, the blowout is so bad, then it's a matter of maybe I bump my line out a little bit so that I've got room to plane away um, the blowout that I'm dealing with. But again, it only happens when you're talking about through cuts. So you know, joinery, yeah, tenons, but who cares? If there's blowout on the back of the tenon, the tenon goes inside the mortise, you'll never see it. Dovetail, there's blowout on the back of the cut. Well, that's gonna be in the inside corner of the case or the drawer box that you're creating. And it's going to disappear once you've glued the whole thing up and put finish on it. So um, the real answer is it happens and you may not have to worry about it at all. So, um, would you ever stone down the set on a new PAX dovetail saw? I've not used a PAX dovetail saw, but more than likely I would uh, want to do that. Most dovetail saws, um, you know, outside the, the premium 
versions have too much set on them. So yes, I would stone it. The thing you have to worry about, or not worry about, but the thing you have to pay attention to is equal stoning on both sides. Um, try the saw first and really see, is it, what kind of curve is it creating? And more importantly, is it pulling one way or another? Because it is pulling one way or another, you, have, you don't have it even set and you have to stone one side more than the other. The, um, the video that I just put out last week perfectly showed that where there was a little too much set on one side and the saw was drifting a bit to the left. So you um, have to kind of play with it a little bit, stone one side, take another test cut and see if it's now running straight. Then once it's running straight, you can at least reduce the kerf a little by stoning it evenly on each side. Um, but until you know that it's running straight, it's kind of like shooting at a moving target. It's a little difficult there. So cool. Well, that's all I got for today, guys. So um, uh, thanks for coming out. Always appreciate it. Um, I don't think I missed any questions, but if I did, I apologize. There's always next week. So um, thanks, everybody. Have a great day.